Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the, uh, the launch of the Coast Guard strategy. My name is Chris Ensley, and I'll be emceeing this event. And as somebody who had the uh, fortunate opportunity to help work on drafting of this strategy, I'm very excited that we're releasing it today. And I'm also excited by the, the overwhelming support we're seeing from the team here. Uh, I was told that we needed to gin up support to get people to come to the room. And this room, they were turning people away at the door, and there's another 500 plus people online, ma'am. Um, uh, we're excited here today to hear about your vision, ma'am, about how we can transform the service. We can transform our total workforce, sharpen our competitive edge, and advance our mission excellence. And these tenants introduced in the, your intent uh, are laid out in this strategy and will show how we can provide specificity in moving forward in these different areas. We've been very thoughtful about thinking about how we roll out this strategy. The fact is that much of the work that's laid out in the strategy belongs in this building. Um, it's the policy work done here by the O4s, the E6s, the E7s, the O5s, and the GS 14s and 15s. It's the acquisition work that goes on in this building and all the other efforts that come together and are critical to achieving our collective success and change across the service. So ma'am, Master Chief, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. With that, Master Chief Jones, please. Hey, how's everybody doing today? First of all, give yourselves a round of applause. Look at this crowd. Wow. You know, I'll, I'll hit it on a second, but yesterday I was in a setting with 575 DOD senior enlisted leaders, so it is nice to be in a room full of blue suitors right now. This is a, yeah, this, this is a much more, more comfortable. But uh, thank you all very much for this opportunity. This is, uh, this is just a really exciting day. This is two things. It's the culmination of a lot of hard work, and it's the starting point of a lot of hard work to come. So we're very excited. You know, I uh, came into this role about five months ago, and, and we have literally traveled around the world. More than once. Uh, yeah, more, more than once. Um, yeah, 10 days into your job, we literally went, went around the world. And everywhere we go, I carry with me and I talk about the hard work of our, our folks here at Coast Guard headquarters. You know, and it's one thing that I've talked to some of the senior enlisted leaders about is we want to kind of change that mindset. You know, people always had the jokes about being at headquarters and the payback tours and the pennants and this and that. We used to say this in Pack Area all the time. We'd come here and leave and go, there is a lot of great work going on here at headquarters every day. And I want to thank you all for, uh, very much for that. You know, as we transform, you know, what, what's not going to stay or what's not going to change is our steadfast commitment to the American public that our people are always going to be ready to answer the call. That is fundamental in our Coast Guard and that will not change. Uh, you know, for, for 230 years, we've responded to every type of event that the, that the country needs. We saw it recently here within the last two weeks with, with Hurricane Ian down in Florida, and we continue to see this. That commitment to the American public for our workforce will not change. The way that we need to get after some work to support those folks to do that mission, that's what's going to change in a new and exciting way. Our missions continue to evolve. Uh, one thing we recognized early on was the need to modernize our, our Coast Guard ethos. And so I want to talk a little bit about that in a second. But first, if we can go ahead and play the ethos, please. In service to our nation. With honor, respect, and devotion to duty. We protect. We defend. We save. We are Semper Paratus. We, we are the United, United States Coast Guard. So you, you may notice, uh, you know, hopefully you notice a little bit of change there. So when we started working this out, you know, we, we have some documents that are already in place. We have the creed of the Coast Guardsmen. That has, that has existed for a long time. That creed is the I. That creed is what each and every one of us as individuals need to be, need to adapt, need to make part of our personal values and who we are to serve in the Coast Guard. The ethos came out and it served us great for a long time, but the ethos always talked about I and I and I. And our whole goal of, twist, of, of, of tweaking that is the creed addresses the I, the ethos addresses the we. It means what we bring as a team and, and we as 88,000 Coast Guard active duty reserve auxiliary civilian, if we all embrace that creed, that I and our personal values, and we bring that together for the we and the ethos, that's the magic spot where we need to be for our American public. So that, that's, that's why we're rolling out. The good news is I sent this out to, our, uh, to the training center, Cape May CO, the uh, command mass chief and the battalion commander this morning in advance of this. Right before coming down here, I got a call from the battalion commander that said, this week's company that graduates, 
we'll say that ethos at graduation this Friday. So very excited about that. You know, as the demand and opportunity grow, uh, you know, for our increasingly challenging environment, our service, we're the sentinels that bridge the gap between the many demanding missions of the Coast Guard, between what the Department of Homeland Security needs from us, what the Department of State needs from us, what the Department of Defense needs for us. That's what our workforce brings. We're uniquely positioned to, to deliver this mission excellence anywhere in our country. What we owe to our workforce is a Coast Guard that's ready to meet those challenges. We owe a talent management system that, that, that addresses a modern workforce. The Commandant says this quite often. Our current policies have served us well for a very long time, but they were designed for a post-World War II era workforce. That is not who we have serving us anymore. Our workforce today is different, it's modern, and we have to be that way. We, we have to, to have policies that support that. You know, one, uh, one really neat thing I mentioned yesterday, I was down in Fort Bliss talking to the uh, U.S. Army Sergeant Majors Academy. It's good to see you here, Mike. Uh, was, that was a great talk yesterday, a uh, great time with them. But let me tell you, it's not just our workforce that is watching us. It's not just our workforce as, that is excited. They are. Everywhere we go, everywhere your, your, your command master chiefs have been out and visited, our workforce is excited. They're pumped. They're energized. But what I learned yesterday is the DOD is watching us. They're excited. They're engaged. So we not only have an opportunity right now to set the Coast Guard for the future, we have the opportunity to, to really and truly model the way for the military workforce of the future in our, in our talent management processes. That's all the good news. The, I don't want to say a bad news. The challenge to each of us here in this building is we have to deliver. The workforce is out there. They're pumped. They're excited. They want to see change. They want to see things differently. They want to serve. They want to see us tear down barriers that, that, uh, that, that prevent them from serving in the, in, to the max of their capacity. We have to deliver. So uh, I'm ready to do this. I'm excited to do this. I love getting out and traveling. I tell everybody everywhere I go, what you do is you give me homework when I get back to the building. I come back, I'm looking at one face in Admiral Panori. There's one face that I meet with almost, I, mean, I actually usually text you from the road, don't I, sir? He loves my midnight text from a hotel room. Uh, hey, sir, this is a great idea, but he always answers back, so thank you very much. Um, but with that, it is my privilege to introduce to you our 27th Commandant, Admiral Linda Fagan. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Steve. <clears throat> Hey, thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. And uh, it is great to see everybody uh, here, right? So we talked a lot about, hey, how do we roll this strategy out? How do we get some excitement around it? And, you know, the Coast Guard runs on our stomach. So we decided we needed to do a lunch event, and I'm glad, uh, uh, glad to see, uh, see everyone uh, here. Uh, I am really excited about the strategy and uh, what's in the document, and I'll, I'll get into some, uh, some more of the details. Uh, what I want, though, to instill in you as we work through this and then go into the Q&A and talk is a sense of ownership. This is not my strategy. It's our strategy. It's not my Coast Guard. It's our Coast Guard. We are at our best when we come together as a united team to help uh, drive some of the progress and change uh, that we need to bring uh, into the organization. Master Chief talked a little bit about what's not changing. I used to say, well, the ethos isn't changing. Well, we did change the ethos a bit. But when you, if you're familiar with the old ethos, right, the, the essence of that ethos is still there. This is just now a tighter articulation of who we are as we serve, uh, we serve the nation. Uh, so we literally have flown around the world more than once. I think I'm pushing 60,000 air miles, not something that I thought uh, I would have experienced in the first uh, four plus uh, months have visited 74 uh, crews and Coast Guard units, and then more significantly have had an opportunity to uh, engage with officials uh, from 49 uh, key partner countries and, uh, and allies. Uh, you know, we talk about the global demand for the Coast Guard. I don't know, we need to change that. We are a global Coast Guard. This is not just demand coming, we are a globally, uh, we globally operate, we have global relevance, and that mission and relevance is being reflected back to us at the most senior levels of the government uh, in a way that I have never seen before. And there's tons of opportunity for us uh, there. Uh, you know, the people that are out doing the frontline work are doing great, great things. The work you are all doing here in this building is absolutely essential to how we operate the Coast Guard. The policy, the programming, the resource, resourcing, the hard 
sort of bureaucratic work that goes with a headquarters function is essential to success for those frontline uh, operators. And whether it's the um, interdicting migrants uh, in the Florida Straits or you know, the East PAC mission or cutters deployed in the West PAC, high latitude, you know, pick a mission set. What you are doing is critical to enabling that, that success. It's going to be critical to how far uh, we're able to advance the, uh, the, the strategy. So the pace of change continues to, uh, to quicken, whether it's geopolitics, climate, societal uh, change. That is, we, sometimes we bemoan change and the pace of change. This is just a reality. Change has been with us uh, as an organization for all 232 years. Uh, we just need to be uh, savvy and attuned to what, uh, what that environment is that we are uh, operating the, the service uh, in. So we have uh, embarked on some pretty aggressive uh, initiatives. Uh, one of the documents, I don't know if we've handed them out right, is the 100-day action, what we've accomplished in the first uh, 100 days. Uh, and it's a pretty impressive list. And I'll, I'll talk through some of that and then some of the uh, intent uh, with regard to the strategy that we're publishing. So you know there's three, uh, three tenets to the Commandant's uh, strategy. The number one priority, though, is workforce and workforce transformation. If, you know, I, the other thing that I like to, uh, to, to say to people is you think about the kind of transformation and different thinking that we need to bring in uh, to the Coast Guard as we, uh, as we man it and operate it is. The riskiest position for us right now as an organization is the status quo. Right? So when people say, oh, we've always done it that way, I'm challenging you to, so in some cases, we've always done it that way, and it's a good thing, and we need to continue to do it. But in more instances than not, we need to challenge that thinking and think differently about whatever, pick that problem set in, in your world of work. I need you to feel empowered to think differently about how we are managing and operating the organization. Uh, and in this uh, workforce and talent management, we are in a race for talent. We're in a race for talent uh, with industry, a race for talent with the other DOD services, and we need to create the environment that excites people to want to come to the Coast Guard. And not in a, you come in at the bottom and you get forced forward at a fixed pace. Uh, right, we need, to, we need to unpack that, allow people to lateral in, uh, opportunities to come and go from the service in a way that's much more dynamic than what we, uh, what we do right now. You know, we're, this is a great organization. I am super excited about uh, you know, still being in the Coast Guard, the opportunity to lead this incredible uh, team. And so our job is to, to um, incite others who are not part of us now to that oppor opportunity. And so there's some of the uh, discussions around uh, recruiting and, uh, and some of the initiatives um, there. So let me highlight a couple of things that, um, that we've done, done already in the, uh, in the first 100 days. We've aligned our medical standards for sessions and retention. We had more uh, restrictive medical standards than our DOD uh, peers. We've aligned. Like, why, why do, should we leave a barrier in place that need not uh, be there? Uh, we're testing a pilot for lateral entry for three rates, EM, HS, CS. So it's easy for mid-career professionals to uh, choose a military career. So think, uh, you know, if you've got civilian credentials, we allow you to come in uh, as a, you know, E4, E5 uh, with a path then to uh, integration. Uh, I do want to say, you know, as I talked about, what doesn't change besides the ethos? What doesn't change is our nature as a military service, the, the commitment to the nation, our value to the nation, who we are as, a, uh, as an organization. That will remain core uh, to who we are as we embark on this, uh, on this transformative um, work. Uh, so we've also instituted an opt-out policy for uh, officers uh, to compete for 0304 when they're ready, sort of take a pause again. Right now, the conveyor belt moves forward at a pretty steady, fixed pace. This allows more fluidity in how uh, folks manage their careers moving forward. We've suspended high year tenure until at least 2025. Right, a tool that's available to us that we certainly don't need it right now, so why, why leave it um, in place? Lots of work to be done. I know there are a number of reps from uh, a CG1 and the Apex uh, team here in the room, but uh, you know, also a shout out to the Apex team for really helping us drive 
uh, drive forward the 100-day initiatives, get this strategy document put together, uh, and now provide the foundation for the work, uh, work that is still in, uh, in front of us. So with regard to uh, sharpen our competitive edge, right? Um, every Coast Guard mission starts and shop, starts and ends at a shore facility, creates data that we need to enliven to uh, employ. And so we're gonna uh, you know, build uh, towards uh, investments in the, the shore uh, infrastructure that we, we know we need to get after. We're gonna develop a 20 year uh, plan for some of those investments so it's a more uh, coherent and integrated strategy around infrastructure as opposed to the just you know, kind of uh, individual uh, looks that we take around uh, the operating footprint that we have as a service. We have uh, stood up the Office of Data and Analytics. I am really excited about uh, that office. Uh, data, we've been creating data for probably as, well, for as long as we've been an organization, certainly since all of the computer systems began to be fielded uh, back in the uh, mid 80s. And yes, I have been in the service long enough to remember a time uh, where I did not have a computer on my desk. Uh, in fact, I like to tell the story as a young ensign on the Polar Star, uh, we came back from the first deep freeze and a computer, a green screen with a floppy disk the size of a pizza uh, went into it and we all stood there and looked at it and said, well, what are we supposed to do with this thing? Right, fast forward where we are, I don't have my phones on me, but right, we've, we've got phones in our pockets that are more capable than what they used to put men on the moon. But we're entering data into those systems and we need to uh, get after the governance around data so that we can enliven what we are already generating uh, information around. So, you know, think AI, machine learning, predictive analytics, a lot of opportunity for us there around, uh, around data. Uh, so with regard to, uh, to, to mission excellence, right, we, we are a global Coast Guard and we need to continue to advance how we operate uh, that, uh, that, that Coast Guard. Uh, we've designed an overhaul for the surge staffing process. How many of us think the old system was serving us well? You don't need to raise your hand. Uh, but, but getting processes into a more mature uh, and relevant uh, you know, way to meet our needs as truly the global Coast Guard that, uh, that we have become. We just last week held our first ever National Risk and Opportunities Conference. It's the first time that the leadership of the organization has come together. So uh, the, the, myself, the vice, all the three stars, and the key assistant uh, commandants, and talked about the national level organizational risk and how we posture the force. We have tended to do that through the lens of the land area commander and the pack area commander. This is the first time that that conversation was elevated to a national DC level conversation around where is the risk? Do we have the force postured appropriately uh, against the risk that we see uh, in the world today? It was, it was a great conversation. And I, you know, I, I was reflecting, I was like, I don't think we've ever done that. I know we've never done that before as a conversation. And it's a uh, reflection again of the maturing uh, and opportunities that we've, um, that we've got as an organization. Another thing uh, that uh, we need to challenge with regard to assumptions is reducing administrative burden, right? This comes up all the time. We've, we've basically, uh, we've, we've put all of the self-help on, on each of you. We've put administrative burden on some of the frontline units and really unpacking that so that we uh, unburden uh, those types of activities that are not, uh, not useful for us. I see nothing but opportunity in the future. I see a lot of change, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, you know, the geopolitical situation continues to evolve far, far more rapidly than I think uh, any of us may have uh, anticipated just a couple of years ago. The pace of climate change, the strength and, and uh, frequency of storms, we don't have to wonder about that. That is all here now. And so this is the imperative for some of the, the change that, uh, that, that we're um, talking about. Um, so. I'm committed to doing this work, but here's my ask of you. I ask that you think differently. I ask you be bold and question traditional assumptions. In some cases, we'll say, nope, that's there for a reason, and we need to continue to, uh, uh, to abide by that. But in many cases, there is opportunity, uh, whether it's around technology or uh, different ways of thinking that we need to bring into the, uh, into the organization. I ask that you collaborate across the organization. You know, we have a very program 
biased focus within this headquarters building and many of the best outcomes that are reflected in the strategy will require uh, cross-cutting synchronization and collaboration across some of the program offices that, uh, that you're representing. Uh, I ask you to try new ideas. Think differently. Break down barriers. So right, a barrier is something that is in place that in, particularly in the uh, human capital world uh, prevents someone who may want to serve uh, from serving. Uh, tattoos would be a great example of it. You know, the, the, the path we've been on to uh, continue to ease uh, the tattoo uh, standard and policy, right? Tattoos should not serve as a barrier to entry. They have no bearing on an individual's ability to operate and contribute uh, to the organization. That's just a, you know, one small example of barriers that we need to, uh, need to look at and consider. Uh, so collaborate, uh, think differently. Uh, Understand and I recognize that not everything we try is going to work. So I, like, we're piloting the lateral program and reserve the right to say, you know what, that actually is not in our best interest as an organization. But until we get that insight and try it, we don't know that. And back to the we are in a race for talent. So creating opportunity for talent to enter the service and contribute to this incredible organization that you know, we all know how, uh, how impressive the organization is. Now we need to uh, you know, bring, bring other, other folks in. Um, so there is risk in what I am suggesting here, and I am not naive to the risk or the culture change that this is going to take. I mean, this is going to take enduring, sustained effort and thinking to bring us into a more uh, you know, flexible, nimble uh, organization around a couple of uh, areas that have been, uh, been pretty um, you know, sort of untouched for, for a while, whether it's the personnel system or some of our uh, operating uh, paradigms. But I go back to what I said at the beginning. The greatest risk is associated with the status quo. If we don't move with a sense of urgency, we will not have the organization, we will not have the talent and the workforce that we need to operate the organization. Right? We're in the midst of the largest acquisition uh, programs that we've had since uh, since World War II. I'm really excited about all the new assets that we've got bringing online. But you can deliver a new ship, but if you don't have talent, you don't have people, heartbeats, it's just a piece of steel. And at the end of the day, we are a, you know we're a people business, and what operates the Coast Guard, why we are the world's best Coast Guard, is the talent reflected here in the room, and the the way we collaborate and innovate and work alongside each other to bring, to bring the organization uh, forward. So this is, again, my ask is that uh, you get familiar with the strategy, that you feel a sense of ownership, a sense of urgency, a sense of excitement over uh, where we're going. There is something in here for every one of you. And I know you've, you're all sitting all over this headquarters building in lots of different, uh, uh, different programs and directorates and uh, you know, have been with us a short time, a long time. Find something that excites you in this document and engage the process that helps, uh, helps bring it forward. So again, this is not my Coast Guard. It's our Coast Guard. This is not my strategy. It's our strategy. Together, we make the organization uh, better. Uh, I'm on this journey alongside of you. you know, my, my goal is to define, hey, this is the aspirational goal and the direction we need to go. Now I need all of us rowing in that direction. And the, the, together, we'll get further down that uh, path than, uh, than if any one of us endeavors to do that uh, individually. So thank you for, uh, for attending. Thank you for committing to, uh, to this journey, uh, for bringing our Coast Guard uh, forward. We, uh, I have no idea how far we're going to get, but I'm confident the organization will be in a better, stronger, more nimble place in, you know, in six months, in a year, in 18 months. And you'll know there's no four-year deadline or closure on this strategy. Done well, this is foundational work for work that continues uh, well into our future for whoever is in my job you know, the next time and the next time and the time after that. This is about doing what's right for us and our service. So thank you. What's that? Yeah, we can do a little Q&A. Yeah. Thanks very much, Admiral. We've got time for a few questions. I know Mike and a couple others are floating around in the back with microphones. So if you're interested, please throw up a hand. We'd love to hear from you. Good afternoon, Commandant. Uh, Commander Andrew Grantham, Civil Rights Directorate. You've 
Thank you for your words today. You spoke at length about thinking differently and challenging the status quo. Uh, I'm wondering, ma'am, oftentimes it's the decision making that can be the biggest resistance to maintaining the status quo. How are we going to decide differently? The challenge here, right, when, when I talk about challenging the status quo, there, there is a huge uh, cultural element to that, right? Not just thinking differently about outcomes, thinking differently about how uh, we get there, right? And there is a, the, the process that, that takes us into decision making, the actual decision making, what we have uh, sort of captured and enculturated as a service, all, uh, all is part of this change that we need to, uh, need to think about. Um, I sometimes talk about this from the context of, right, we have a, we have a strong tradition as a 232-year-old organization uh, to go, oh, either we've always done it that way or, oh, I know how to do this, again, because we've always done it that way. And then you, you know, we just kind of fall back into the, the wagon wheel ruts and go forward. Uh, so our uh, assignment processes and promotion processes uh, on both the officer and enlisted side are good examples of uh, you know, where we've got a playbook that, that we know works, that's safe, uh, but all uh, in need of update and fresh so that when the decisions are being made on you know, something as simple as who goes where next, that that's done in a way that, that is more nuanced than just the needs of the service. The needs of the service will always uh, prevail, but that are much more uh, reflective of the kind of uh, flexibility and opportunity and stability that the workforce is gonna, gonna ask for us. And um, so right, this, your question gets right to the heart of culture change, and each of us needs to uh, play an active role in helping uh, bring that culture forward, and in particular, you know, I look at the group here, this is a pretty senior group, both on the officer and enlisted side, right? Think about, as you're having these culture struggles and conversations, uh, think about where the culture keepers are in the organization. I would suggest they're the, uh, they're the E5s and the E6s, to some extent the chiefs, but really E5s, E6s, and they're the lieutenants, right? That's our audience for all of this. That's when, when they're uh, behaving in the new ways of thinking and are engaged in uh, doing things differently than, w than we are moving, moving forward and moving the, moving the needle forward. Thanks. I'm New Admiral. My name is uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Dennis Dalen with uh, CG86. Um, so I'm just coming off EXO tour in Guam and my enlisted members are really feeling the pain of higher inflation rates and yeah. housing going up and stock market going down and so I guess do we have a, a strategy to ensure that our people can continue to afford a comfortable lifestyle? All right, Admiral Panor, are you ready to jump on if I say anything bad, right? So <laughs> there, th this is an absolute, we, we get it. Th that's, that's the number one thing we get everywhere we go is, is, is the cost of living. And there's a multi-prong multi approach to what's going on, and, and it deals with immediate injects now to kind of stop the bleeding, and then long-term process change to, to make these processes more adaptable and more... Uh, more flexible. So like immediate injection, and we've all seen the stuff that rolled out from Secretary of Defense with um, you know, the 28 MHAs and the immediate inject into, uh, in, into BAH in those areas. Uh, we saw, what, six months ago we had the, the mileage change. And what I tell the workforce is, uh, the, the, when we do all hands is don't look at that four cent TDY and PCS mileage change or the 28 MHAs that just got a, a BAH bump. Don't look at that as, as our team spiking the football and saying victory. What we need to look at is this is the first time in almost two and a half to three decades that we've had mid-year changes to any of these rates. That means our overseers hear us, our message is resonating. So that's just, that's just, we're, it's just building blocks and steps. So we're continuing on that. Uh, one, you know, on the, on the pay side, we're, we're entering our quadrennial review of military compensation. Master Chief Sauls will be happy. I finally got that out without sputtering on that one. That's just something where we're, we're, we're taking a look, and this is where we're going after just the base pay, uh, especially on the enlisted side, because if you, look, if you look at the pay scales between officer and enlisted, where everyone's kind of gotten pay raises over the years, but if you look at a 12-year gap, the, the officer pay scale has increased just a, just a little bit more than the enlisted pay scale, so we'll really take a look at how we close the gap. And then the, the long-term piece is our processes for BAH validation, COLA, things like that. 
We're, we're going to have to go after legislative change that allows us to where we can get inject points, whether it's a three or four times a year, whether you know quarterly or semi-annual, because the market, as we know, the market doesn't wait on anything. It'll, it'll change overnight. We need to have something that's more flexible to inject there. So it's kind of a holistic approach that we're looking at on that, sir. You know, also in the strategy, right, you're the, I'm transitioning to talking about family services, housing, child care, health care. We recruit an individual, but right, that retention then hinges on family services and family support and having a more uh, deliberate and intentional focus with regard to the kinds of, you know, whether it's what, what the Master Chief's just unpacked with regard to, you know, how we, how we energize the, the system that we use for housing and BAH, but there's investments we need to make in health care, uh, there's, there's child care conversation, and you know, I keep getting pressed, well, will we build a child development center in position X? Well, maybe that's the right answer in position X, but maybe it's increased child care subsidies and, and uh, you know, what the, what the drivers and stressors are for our workforce. There's not a one-size-fits-all because, you know, you can be in a remote lo location in Jonesport, Maine, or you can be at, you know, Portsmouth, base Portsmouth, lots of units. So the, the um, uh, having uh, strategies that are re responsive and reflective of the, the realities for our people on the, on the ground. And then there's the Airbnb effect, right? Yeah. That's, that's really part of what's significantly disrupted some of the, uh, the housing and driven, driven cost up. You want to share the Newport example we got when we were there? Oh, yeah. So the mayor, board? so Airbnb, particularly in our, um, you know, many of the port uh, communities and um, resort communities that we, we operate in uh, has had a dramatic effect. And when we were in Newport for the uh, rehome porting of the 270s, uh, the mayor was there and was quite proud and, and, and uh, good for her uh, that they had passed an ordinance that prohibited uh, the number of days you can list a uh, single-family residence on Airbnb in the uh, uh, in the heart of Old Town uh, Newport, and there's probably others that are going to need to need to go in that direction. Uh, afternoon, Admiral Master Chief. Um, in regards to attracting and retraining people, how far are we willing to change our uniform and weight policies? So that. We are going to have to. We will have to have that conversation at some point. You know, we've we have we have struggled as an organization with regard to what exactly is the weight program. Is it a health program? Is it a fitness program? Is it something else? I don't know that it does any one of those things uh, particularly well. I was at uh, I was in New York uh, last week engaging with some business executives and was talking. I was somewhat bemoaning the fact that the population that we need to draw from uh, is shrinking. The population with a propensity to serve, and then frankly, uh, people who are able to meet the medical and fitness standards. And um, so it, the, the business executive says, we, you, ought to, you need to think differently about that. So one, first you need to ask, are our current medical and fitness standards appropriate for the first work the force we're trying to hire? Maybe yes, maybe no, but we need to ask the question. And then two, how do you expand, how do you increase the pool of people that are qualified? And you've seen what the Navy has done, they're sort of, I'm calling it pre-boot camp, boot camp, but right, where you take uh, people who, I think in the case of the Navy, up to 20% uh, over the weight standard and bring them in and basically start, you know, get, educating folks on decent uh, nutrition and exercising them and then and getting them ready for a boot camp. I think all of that is going to need to be on the table as we look at uh, look at talent and how we uh, how we expand the pool that we're going to be able to uh, to draw from. Um, right, we have standards in place. They've been in place for a reason. We may conclude, nope, they all need to stay exactly. But as but as we look at uh, what the talent is we need and what the you know fitness and health level is we need, we need to be really intentional with regard to some of those assumptions. Yeah, and so on two things there, on the, on the uniform side, and I, I don't want to fly the plane and build it in front of you all right now, but Deputy and I have just kind of unearthed some, some concerns that we, we need to work through, not, not Coast Guard concerns, but on the DOD side, some things we need to work through. So I've got some homework to do on that end before I speak publicly about it. But on the standard side, you know, the Commandant mentioned um, you know, the, the Navy program. You know, I hear a lot, well, the Navy does this or the Air Force does it, and people always say DOD branches, and I want to be very clear, we should always be informed by what the DOD is doing. 
but not necessarily think that we necessarily need to be like the DOD. And the reason I say that is, go walk in, a, go walk in. I was in an auditorium yesterday, 575 DOD senior enlisted leaders. None of them were prior Coasties. But I bet we have some prior DOD folks in this room. You know, so I, <laughs> the reason I say we don't jump to the DOD side <laughs> is people come to the Coast Guard for a reason. So we need to be informed by them, but still hold what, what's, what's great about our Coast Guard. But I, I'm already getting feedback from, from the Navy that that program is not going very well for them because folks that are going out into the field, basically the admin burden and the, the, the not fit for duty and inability to do the job is just being passed on to the field units in the Navy, and it's just kind of, kind of exacerbating that problem down the line. One thing, and I'm looking at two folks from Cape May here recently that will, that will correct me on this if I'm wrong, but one thing I talked to this team about right before our Captain Felger's change of command was what, what differences are we seeing in the young women and men coming to Cape May now, two and a half, three years into COVID? And we kind of do this forming week, physical fitness standard, and then graduation week, physical fitness standard, correct? And what I've been told is hands down, it's that forming week, physical fitness standard. It was upwards of 70 percent what's that 50 to 60 percent were passing forming but going into remedial which was like a threefold increase in master chief and ice time yeah so so that you know these these are th I, I thought it was going to be human interaction skills you know things like that they said it's none of that it's, it's that physical fitness standard so like the comment i said we have to ask what is going to be our standard and ch challenge what our standard is now see if we can tweak that standard if we need to tweak that standard if we don't and set that going forth. Yeah, apparently sit-ups are the new mile and a half run. I learned this at a visit at Fletzy. They were like everybody reporting for a, for tactical coxswain training, and they couldn't do the, I don't know what, it's 35, 40, I don't know what this, I was like, I was appalled. It was like, you can't do that many setups. Video games, there's a lot of, a lot of reasons behind it, but <laughs> I'm not the video game generation, just in case you were wondering. <laughs> so my main question is one that hasn't been asked yet, but it's something that is very important. When we talk about talent acquisition and retainment, I'm talking about mental health. What are some of the programs, like if someone were to get into a situation where they don't feel like they can perform as they can and they don't feel like they can rely on the people within their unit, what are the programs to get them back into that status of being a reliable, productive member within yeah. the Coast Guard? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, right, mental health, after actually even before housing, mental health and access to mental health care is one of the number one concerns uh, out there with the workforce and it comes up uh, time and time again. And so we have made investments in fielding mental health professionals uh, into our clinics and uh, into communities. And I think, we, I think we've got at least one that we've added here. I'm looking at Doc Thomas. Uh, it's not enough, though. We need to continue to uh, invest uh, in mental health care capacity and, frankly, just organic health care as it pertains to how we uh, operate as an, as an operating uh, organization. And so there's ongoing uh, work there. The other thing, and this is not something that requires a resourcing investment, it's the getting comfortable talking about mental health and destigmatizing. Uh, the feeling that some people have that if I seek help, it will have a negative impact on my career. That's not the case. We need to uh, enable people to feel safe and secure in seeking uh, the professional help uh, that, that we need and help, uh, help folks that uh, may find themselves uh, you know, in stress, duress, and, and you know, it could be any one of us at any point. And so it's a, uh, it is an important uh, topic. And unfortunately, uh, you know, as we come out of, you know, last month was Suicide uh, Prevention Month. Unfortunately, we've had, we've had 10 suicides uh, in the past, you know, in the past uh, year in the Coast Guard. You know, every one of those is, it's one too many. And when we talk about readiness and impact and erosion of readiness, a suicide is probably the most, uh, disruptive and just painful thing that a unit can go through, that family members can go through. And so this really requires attention of, uh, of, of all of us. But thank, thanks, Darius. You mind if I hit a couple sure, things go on ahead. So number one, I need everybody to hear me loud and clear. It is okay to not be okay. It's okay to struggle. Because 
Struggle is called life. Everybody has good days, bad days. But, but if somebody breaks an ankle, is anybody going to keep coming to work for six, seven weeks on a broken ankle and not go get medical help? No. Well, some stubborn people will. But most of us, <laughs> we'll go to the doctor. We'll get put in a... I see where Doc Thomas is looking right now. I see you. I see you. You're eyeballing out. I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> um, sorry, sir. I just put you on blast. Um, <laughs> But no, you're going to go to the dock, you get the x-ray, you get put in the cast, and is anybody on, on the crew going to question you? No, they got you back. They can see it. Why is it any different if you can't see where somebody's struggling? So we, we, like, the, like the boss said, we have to be willing to talk about it, and we have to get out there, and we have to get past perceptions and barriers, because someone's perception is their reality. Whether it's factual or not, if they believe it to be true, in their mind it's true, and we have a lot of misperceptions in the workforce depending on if you're this rating or this rating or this rating, if you say you need help, your career is over. Those are factually not true. I asked yesterday, and I know our amazing rating force mass chiefs are going to do this, I asked them all to gather all the facts about anything related to mental health care in their rating and, and impacts and communicate, out that, communicate that out to their rating because there may be some differences depending on the jobs and this. But the Rating Force Master Chiefs are going to take this on and they're communicate. We've got to get past these barriers and these misperceptions and realize it's okay. Good afternoon, Commandant McPog. Um, thank you for your time today. My question is about um, going back to the focus on the people um, and total workforce management. And I think what I've seen over the years, it's, it seems like some years when we're focusing on modernizing the fleet, infrastructure, then some of the people programs get cut. And now it seems like, you know, we've kind of, the pendulum has swung a little bit. Now we're focusing on people in the workforce and recruiting. And I'm curious what concessions we're making on the operational side or where are we cutting back there to enable us to focus on, on people? Yeah, so uh, when you go through the 100-day document with regard to people, uh, while it is significant, uh, the policy changes and things, what, what is reflected in there is change that we had authority to make that didn't require big money or people resource investments. Some of the onward work is going to require us to, to uh, think about uh, where and how we resource. Like I'll use, for example, I, how, many, do we, how many assignment officers do we have in here? I assume we've got a couple of assignment officers. So I had a chance to talk to the assignment officer. This is There's almost all of them. There's right there. There's three of them, <laughs> right? This is almost all of them, I found out, right? And so one of the feedbacks we get is, hey, the system isn't responsive to me. It's because we actually don't have enough capacity in the assignment system to run it the way we would like to. Uh, with regard to the reality now that we're at a 2,000, what's the non-rate shortfall? I'm looking to get the, because uh, it changes, what, 15, 25, oh wow. All right, it's got, last time I brought it up, it, anyhow, 2,500 non-rates short in the organization. I'm sorry, total. All right, what non-rates? So it's uh, 850. 850, almost 1,000, right? The non-rate shortage is the petty officer shortage. And we are uh, teeing up for the LC here in a couple weeks, this exact conversation. As we, you know, one, accelerate into recruiting to get talent, uh, you know, increase the flow of talent into the organization, we've got operational impacts now. I was at a, um, where were we? I was in all hands. I was giving out informal awards at the end. And in the write-up, they were acknowledging that this particular 270 had sailed at 65% of the deck force capacity. Well, that's not okay. And so being honest with ourselves organizationally about where we are, what, what safe, ready capacity can we generate now as we, as we build back into uh, a more ready force? And we're, we're having that conversation. I don't have, I don't have a good X, Y, Z answer, but, uh, but we owe that. We, the leadership team, we, the headquarters team, as it pertains to program and policy, owe that clarity uh, to, uh, to the frontline uh, operators. So which is why I keep coming back to, if we don't have people, it doesn't matter that we're going to buy and build a new icebreaker. It doesn't matter that we've announced the WCC. If we don't have the people, it, we, we, uh, we quickly uh, don't, don't provide the return on investment for the American public. So ma'am, you asked where we were with that, that shortage, everywhere we go. We, it's everywhere. Yeah, everywhere we go, we get that. Uh, so, and, and a couple things too, and I, I was talking to an all hands group the other day, and I told them, see, you know, when, when you look at the, the, the previous commandants teams for the last three or four, 
they've done an amazing job. When it comes to buying things, steal things that float and fly, we are on an amazing trajectory. And we're, we're and not that that doesn't still need maintaining and working and focus, that, that does. We're good there, which allows the current leadership team to focus on, as Vice Admiral Thomas put this the other day, the, the best way I've heard it put is the tail. Is, is we, 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 ha we can improve in the way we, we, we buy the, 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 the maintenance tail of, of, that comes with everything. And that's where this leadership team is so keenly focused is saying, yeah, we need this piece of thing that, that floats or flies, but we need the humans that come with it. We need the, 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 the policy that comes with it. We need to house them. We need to feed them. We need to clothe them. We need to, you know, their, their, their kids in a child care. We need medical clinics. That's the focus of this leadership team. And it's been enabled because our predecessors have gotten us in such a good place with, with those things that float and fly. Um, good afternoon, Admiral. Good afternoon, Master Chief. I am IS3 Pompos. I work at the SIP. And we've been talking about recruiting and gaining people. And I've seen a big increase in chat on the MyCG page about the Everyone's a Recruiter program. Yep. And I understand going out and talking to people. What should we be telling them about the Coast Guard when we go out and talk to people about it? Yeah. So what you should be telling them is what your experience in the organization has been. What a great, how much opportunity we offer as an organization. Uh, you know, for some people, medical care will resonate. For others, the, um, our, um, you know, the education benefits. Uh, the opportunity to serve something greater than self. And the incredible workforce that you get to work with. Do you, you know, we've all come from different backgrounds and have found different paths into the organization. I do not take for granted ever what an incredible workforce we have. I mean, it's why I'm still in uniform, is because I get to come to work every day and work with this incredible group of people. And oh, by the way, we get to do some really cool stuff, right? That is um, absolutely a valued, uh, to the American people. That's what you need. And you need to you know, enlighten people, excite them, make them aware of who and what we are. I, you know, I've been talking about, we, we probably do need a more deliberate marketing campaign. We just think we're so great, everybody knows who we are. Well, they don't. Right? Occasionally, the DOD guys find their way over. And in fact, as I work with my peers, the number of them that have said to me, oh, if I'd only known. If I'd only known, I would have gone to the Coast Guard Academy, not West Point. Right? So we suffer a little bit from that lack of awareness. So again, and ask, every one of you should be shouting on the rooftops about how incredible the organization is and what the opportunity is uh, that, that we offer. And oh, by the way, you get to work with some pretty awesome and cool uh, people along the way and jump out of helicopters and drive boats and you know, do, all the, do all the cool frontline stuff that we'll get to go back and do, right? It's just a set of orders. But, but not, not if you go to the academy. Not if you go to the yeah. academy. Right? She went to the academy thinking she'd get to do what a BM2 does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I said, you own it all now. You can if you want. But. <laughs> all right. There's good morning, ma'am. Um, so I know one of the strategies is about getting uh, advancement with technology. And there's always that great push to get us on the next level, um, especially within prevention industry outpacing us beyond. Mm -hmm. um, there's one thing to be to develop the, the technology and to have those systems, but to have those things get into the hands of the frontline workers. Is there anything in the development or on the holistic side of the way to get that technology into the hands of the frontline workers so we can actually improve and move the Coast Guard into the next generation? Yeah, so we have done some of that. Where's Rusty? <laughs> talk, to, talk to Rear Admiral Select Dash down here. He'll give you the whole, uh, whole unpacking. But so we have accelerated some of that technology into the frontline uh, uh, hands, particularly the prevention folks. Uh, we're modernizing and changing the learning system around how we, you know, create that uh, that expertise. Uh, and so it's kind of it's a it's a multifaceted approach. When it, we we have been slow as an organization uh, to bring in what all you know commercial off the shelf kind of technologies think uh, scan eagle and uas right that's probably our most recent uh, ingest of substantial you know kind of cutting edge technology so this too is part of as we think about how we do marine inspections there's a whole conversation we need to have around are we doing it the right way now 
you know, once we enliven our data and we get into uh, some more predictive analytics, uh, the, the time-based inspections that we do but really no longer would serve as well, that you, you get to the point that you're able to predict that this ship, this issue, is going to be where the next risk uh, to the port is. And so there's a, there's a huge data component to that. And then, frankly, just mobile technology in the hands of frontline folks so that as you're being required to enter that data into the system that we're going to increasingly uh, enliven, and we need to make it, uh, make it easy. Um, you know, there's an app for that, right? I joke. There's an app for that, right? We need to, we need to continue to, uh, to move out. All right. Hey, thank you. Master Chief, do you have any kind of closing thoughts or anything yeah, you want Two things, if you don't mind, ma'am. So, so number one, I just, like the, like the boss said, there's a lot of challenges ahead, but they're nothing but opportunities. And that's, and one thing I want us to think, think through, because I know this building is ready for it. I know we're up to the challenge. I know we're, we're ready to think differently and do things differently. Let's remember to think through also how we're we messaging, messaging it to the field because um, that's, that's the struggle. That, that's the struggle. And, and as your senior leaders, both enlisted and officer, travel around and you ask somebody, hey, have you heard about this? And, and they, they say, uh, well, no, I haven't. I'm just like, oh, my God, we've, we've done six art articles and three messages and this and that. So we have to think through how we're getting that information into the hands of our folks in the field. And the second thing, and I just remind everybody of, of this every single day, two things we control every day that nobody can take from us, and that's our attitude and our effort that we bring to work. And let, let's remember that every single morning. Get up, come to this building, give your best, have your best attitude, and give your best effort. If you bring that every single day, I'll take this team and take on the world. All right, thanks. Thanks, Master Chief. Hey, thank you. Thanks, sir. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I am really excited. This... Uh, this is an incredible time to be in the uh, Coast Guard. And um, we've, uh, we are enjoying support at multiple levels of the government that I, that I have never seen before. Like from levels of the government where people a couple years ago would have gone, Coast Guard? What? Uh, right? So it is uh, an incredibly exciting uh, time. Nothing but opportunity in front of us. Uh, I, uh, like I say, I, you know, I view my role as this kind of is defining the end state that we're driving towards and then creating the environment that allows all of us to endeavor in that direction in a way that brings us significantly uh, forward uh, as, an, as an organization. Uh, I meant what I said about the workforce. It is what leaves me excited to come to work uh, every day. I will put our workforce up against any other and we will outpace them and outrun them. Uh, I have absolutely no doubt. You know, as we send uh, liaison officers and you know folks over there, whether it was uh, Operation Allied Welcome or Hurricane and the FEMA Ops Center, pick pick a thing. Always the feedback comes. Hey, that you know that lieutenant or that petty officer, they were awesome. Did you hand pick them? And I get to say, no, not actually. I've got like a whole locker of people just like that with all of that great leadership and enthusiasm and uh, can-do uh, attitude. So thank you. And uh, really, it's been a privilege to spend a little bit of time with you. Hopefully, the poke egg bowls and teriyaki. It looks like everybody's done eating. So uh, thanks, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conversation. Thank you.